The D&D 5th Edition Player's Handbook contains 9 playable parent races, 10 if you give Drow their own category like Baldur's Gate 3 does. 7 of these 10 races are currently available as choices in early access. Drow, Humans, Dwarves, Elves, Half-Elves, Halflings, and Tieflings. This leaves out the mighty Dragonborn race, the Gnomes, and of course the beloved Half-Orcs. Those three races in particular, most of us are already assuming will end up being in the game at some point, because it's unlikely that Larian Studios will leave out any of the core 5th edition races. But this video is not going to be about the more predictable and likely additions to Baldur's Gate 3. Early Access has also shown us races and many sub-races outside of the player's handbook, such as the Gith Yankee race, the Half Drow, Zeriel Tieflings, and more. So what other non-conventional races might we see? Well, if you are a player that searches every inch of every area and doesn't leave a book or script unread, then you may have found some references or hints as to some of the other races that might become available to us as players. And these races are interesting to say the least. If you end up enjoying this video, please subscribe for there will be much more Baldur's Gate 3 content on the way. Links to my Twitter and my Discord server will be below. Let's get right into it. While exploring the Druid's Grove in Early Access, one may come across a book titled The Realm According to Bumpo. This book can be found in the area where the Tiefling refugees have set up, and it belongs to Danis and Bex, a Tiefling couple anxious to start their new life in the city of Baldur's Gate. If you can pop off a minor illusion and steal it, or just steal it and run, you'll get to read an interesting little passage detailing the adventuring experiences of the fictional rube Gabin Bumpo. But they weren't half so strange as the bird folk. First Aarakocra I met had the head of a parrot, the body of a human, and wings also of a parrot. I tried not to stare, but it was real hard. Turns out she was one of a motley party, cause around her table were a tabaxi, cat folk, a genasi, element folk, and a turtle, turtle folk. Trying to act casual, I asked what the hell they all were. They ignored me, but I can't blame them. To them, I must have looked awfully dull and average, for they were the first of their kind I'd seen, but I was just one of a billion boring humans to them. In that passage, there were four races that were mentioned. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that they will be in the game, but content like this, especially in early access, a stage where companies know that players are going to pick apart everything they can get their hands on, oftentimes does have a significant meaning behind it. So let me introduce you to these four races and also give you an idea as to what classes go well with them. And at the end of the video, I'll even throw in a bonus race. So make sure to stick around for that. The Aarakocra are a race of avian humanoids, or as Bumpo and many others say, the bird folk. They stand around 5 feet tall and have a wingspan of around 20 feet. Many Aarakocra have hands that are located halfway along each wing, and they have three human-sized fingers and a thumb, allowing them to use weapons. As you can see in the picture though, they can also have arms that are separate from their wings, giving them even more maneuverability. The Aarakocra are generally peaceful creatures that lean towards the good alignments, and most of them actually come from the elemental plane of air. The ones that can be found in the material plane, such as on Faerun, are often found sequestered in high mountains atop tall trees. The Aarakocra's most special racial feature is of course that they can walk and fly, which would make them an extremely interesting and useful race to play in Baldur's Gate 3, especially with all of its verticality. Other unique racial features might include being able to do unarmed attacks with their talons, conduct aerial dive attacks, and possibly even summon air elementals. If this race does end up in the game, it's likely that they'll get a plus two to dexterity, along with a plus one to wisdom. This makes them great for classes such as rangers, monks, rogues, druids, clerics, and fighters. Genasi are plain-touched humans, infused with the power of the elements. They are most often the offspring of a genie, which comes from the elemental planes, and a human. This gives them a human-like appearance with unusual skin colors. Some Genasi live as outcasts, while others gain positions of great influence in places where elemental beings are revered. 
the most common genasi take on traits and appearances from the corresponding elemental plane that their genie parent was from. The four elemental planes include air, earth, water, and fire. This race as a whole tends to be of a more neutral alignment. The genasi's most special racial features depend on what element they descend from. Air genasi may get benefits to breathing, for they can hold their breath indefinitely, and they may also gain the levitate spell. Earth genasi can move across some types of difficult terrain at normal speeds, and they get access to the pass without a trace spell. Fire genasi get dark vision, fire resistance, and get the produce flames cantrip and the burning hands spell. In water genasi can breathe air or water, they gain acid resistance, they can swim of course, and they also know the shape water cantrip and create or destroy water spell. All Genasi will likely get a plus two to constitution, making them great for all classes. And then depending on the element that you choose, air gives a boost to dexterity, earth gives strength, fire gives intelligence, and water wisdom. So the Genasi can go well with every class. The Tabaxi are also known as the cat folk or jaguar people, are a race of feline humanoids. They typically stand six to seven feet tall and have slender bodies with long tails and retractable claws. They come from a large continent west of Faerun called Maztica, a land filled with jungles and mysteries. Most of this race remains in their distant homeland in small tight clans, but some do wander far and wide seeking stories, artifacts, and lore. Tabaxis tend to align towards the chaotic alignments, for they let impulse and fancy guide their decisions. The Tabaxi's most special racial feature would be its ability to climb, and like I said with the Aracopra and its flight, having more vertical movement will certainly help in this game. Other features may include dark vision, feline agility which gives you increased movement in combat with some limitations, using your claws for unarmed strikes, and gaining proficiency in perception and stealth. Tabaxis will gain a plus two to dexterity along with a plus one to charisma, making them great for dexterity based builds, such as rangers, rogues, monks, and fighters. They also can make great warlocks, sorcerers, and even paladins. Perhaps the most fun race of them all is the Turtle. Combine this with the monk class and you got yourself a Baldur's Gate 3 Ninja Turtle. Turtles are a race of intelligent tortoise-like humanoids. They stand 5 to 6 feet tall and weigh around 450 pounds. They of course have large shells on their backs that are capable of containing their entire bodies, and these also serve as their mobile and stationary homes. Most turtles don't feel the need to root themselves in one place for too long, and their settlements are used more as moots for socialization, information sharing, and as a place for safer trading. Turtles have a simple view on the world, and they see beauty in the ordinary, and although they tend to live in isolation, they do enjoy forming strong friendships. Adventurous turtles can spend years in a city, most often the human cities, and study and marvel in the architecture while learning new skills. Most turtles tend to be of the lawful good alignment, but some of the more greedy and selfish ones could become a little evil. A turtle's special racial feature is their shell defense, which allows them to withdraw into their shell gaining a plus four to their armor class, an advantage on strength and constitution saving throws until they come back out. Other racial features may include their ability to hold their breath for extended periods of time. Their shells serve as their armor and give them a base of 17 armor class, and they gain proficiency in the survival skill. Turtles should also get a plus two to strength and a plus one to wisdom. They are great for classes such as the fighter, barbarian, cleric, druid, strength-based rangers, and monks. Really, you can make a ninja turtle. Kawabunga. So those were the four interesting, unique races that were mentioned in that book, and that could very well be a hint as to what is to come, or maybe it's not. There's many other interesting, unique races that could show up in this game, such as the Azamar, the Lizard Folk, Goliaths, or maybe we'll even be playing as a goblin. Who really knows? All right, on to the fifth bonus race, or should I say sub-race, and the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because next to the Bumpo book is another book, and if the Bumpo book actually turns out to be significant, then it's important that we take a look at this book as well. 
This book is titled The True and Impossible Adventures of Tenebra Maro, and in the excerpt we learn that Maro is an interplanar ship captain, or so she claims. It reads as, And thus, in the light of the Feywild's never-setting sun, we passed into the land of the Eladrin. My astute resolution to sail around their forest was betrayed. It seems to me that the river itself conspired to change course, bringing the new bride into the shadow of the trees that I might see those dancing figures up close. The form of the Eladrin, with which I am now intimately familiar, is that of elves as seen in a fever dream. Slender as wands and with hair of every changeable hue, their moods mirror that fey wilderness from which they spring, one moment gentle as a still pond, the next inexorable and deadly as a falling mountain. So the Eladrin elves live in the twilight realm of the Feywild, and they are creatures of magic with strong ties to nature. Their cities in the Feywild will sometimes cross over to the material plane, appearing briefly in mountain valleys or deep forest glades before fading back. These elves represent everything that was once wild and primal within the elven kind. If this ancient subrace of elves somehow make it into the game, players will likely gain many of the racial features that elves in general get, and also probably gain many fey type stuff such as the spell Misty Step, which will allow you to teleport. And I'm going to leave it at that because the Eladrin elves were actually part of 4th edition D&D, and if they make it into Baldur's Gate 3, I'm not entirely sure what to expect. And that will be it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed this speculation type video. And maybe some of you guys learned about some new D&D &D races that will likely at least show up in the game. And maybe we'll actually be able to play them. I'm not really sure. Let me know your guys' thoughts below in the comments. Let me know some other books that you guys found or anything. I'm I don't know if I really want to talk about data mining stuff. That's not really what this channel is about. I got nothing against data mining, but it's kind of stuff that the company doesn't want you to see. And that would ruin my experience and maybe some of you guys as well. If you guys ended up enjoying this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. I really appreciate it. It's a huge help to my videos. I do all sorts of content on this channel, ranging from live streams to game reviews to game tutorials to lore videos to class guides and much more. So turn on those bell notifications if you don't want to miss future content. Until next time.